next meeting will now come to order. City Clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember Finn. Here. Councilmember Hunt. Here. And Councilmember Leone. Here. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of September 20th, 2016. Tonight's study session will include a presentation by um, both city staff and representatives from two of our employee organizations. Uh, this is not a time where we will negotiate our, um, with our organizations. This is a time when the, the organizations will have an opportunity to present their interests to the city council and um, we will listen openly and um, better understand the interests that you will have as negotiations begin. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, Carl Swenson, city manager. Great, thank you, Mayor Carlett. Um, and just uh, maybe a little bit more uh, on this step in our negotiation process. Um, of course, in Arizona, there's no state law uh, that governs or dictates um, how negotiations uh, occur uh, or even whether cities will recognize employee associations. Um, so that each city that does recognize employee associations like the city of Peoria has done, uh, does so uh, by the ordinances that the city council adopt. And so the recognition of the employee associations occur through uh, council uh, recognition, through adoption of that ordinance. Um, and the process by which negotiations occur uh, with those employee associations is also governed by um, the city council in your, in your policies, in your um, uh, stricture that is uh, governed within the city code and adopted by ordinance. Um, so that said, uh, most of you will remember a couple of years ago, we went through and updated how we do the negotiation process. Um, and uh, as a precursor of that, um, I ask an employee uh, committee to come together and uh, look at the code and to recommend changes to the city council uh, for how we can update and modernize the, the, the way we do uh, collective bargaining in the city. Uh, it was a good process. Um, the, um, the committee was made up of uh, directors, uh, by and large, of the city, but in, involved and included uh, representatives from the employee associations who were invited to give their perspective um, and to add to the recommendations that went to the council. And in the end, um, the employee associations were comfortable and supported the, all the recommendations that went to the city council, and they were ultimately adopted by the council, and those are the rules that we're following now. One of the key steps uh, that were recommended, or was recommended by the employee association was this step, uh, was an opportunity for the uh, employee groups before bargaining uh, begins to have an opportunity to sit down uh, with you uh, and present their interests. Um, and as, as council is well aware, and, and I think all of the, the city staff, we uh, approach bargaining from an interest uh, orientation rather than what you consider as the traditional positional uh, collective bargaining. We try to stick to interest-based uh, negotiations. Uh, we believe that um, that that's the best way to. Uh, um, operationalize the partnership we have with our employee associations, and, and I want to underscore partnership. Uh, we believe in that, um, and this step uh, should be the beginning of uh, what will hopefully be a, a positive negotiation process. Now, all that said, um, we typically uh, don't get into bargaining at this point, as, as the mayor just mentioned. Um, this is a place where uh, we will articulate the council's policies, that is Laura Krauss, our human resources director, will do that. And then each of the employee associations is free to, to present their interests in whatever format, style, level of detail that, uh, that they choose. Of course, uh, ours are, uh, as they've been in the past, um, high level. Um, aspirational uh, in terms of the goals and we, we leave the negotiations of the, the pay increases and, and wages, working conditions, other, other uh, items of bargaining uh, to the bargaining table and we don't uh, engage uh, in those uh, in, in this session tonight. So I thought I'd just kind of give a little bit of a, of a table setting to this because it is an unusual step. I don't know that any other uh, city in Arizona does this, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's a, a step that um, our employee associations have wanted and, and enjoyed, I think, uh, in the past, although 
presenting to the city council is probably not enjoyable, but I'm sure you guys <laughs> will, will make the most of it. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Laura Krauss, our human resources director, and she can uh, give you a little bit more information. Thank you, Carl. Good evening, Mayor and Council. On tonight's agenda, an overview of the meet and confer process, a little bit about what Carl just talked about. We'll talk about the timeline involved in the negotiations. We will present City Council's interest tonight, and then we will hear from two employee groups on their interest in negotiations. As Carl mentioned, there's no federal law or state law that requires that we do a meet and confer process. Nothing requires that we recognize employee organizations, um, but the City of Peoria has a meet and confer process that was created by the City Council. It's in, in City Code um, Chapter 19. We recognize four employee groups, four bargaining units. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees represents about 400 of our employees. The Peoria Police Officers Association, PPOA, represents about 140 of our police officers. City of Peoria Police Supervisors are um, police sergeants representing 25 employees. And the Phoenix Firefighters Association Peoria Chapter, PFFA, representing about 160 firefighters, engineers, and captains. There are two contracts that are getting ready to expire. Um, COPS, they have a four-year contract. It expires June 30th of 2017. The PFFA contract also expires. It was a two-year contract, but it expires June 30th of 2017 as well. The city code identifies three areas that we will negotiate, wages, hours, and conditions of work. So um, beginning very soon, we will be discussing those three areas and hopefully um, it will result in a memorandum of understanding with both of these groups that will be effective July 1 of 2017. And Carl alluded a little bit to this. We do not do traditional bargaining. We do try and do interest-based bargaining. We focus on common interests. Um, we look at mutually acceptable solutions and we collaborate and hopefully come to a win-win decision at the end. A reminder of the roles, um, City Council provides direction to us, the staff negotiators. Um, you define priorities and objectives for our outcomes. And then as a reminder, City Code prohibits contact with, uh, between City Council and the employee negotiators during the process. We negotiate ways to implement your direction. We communicate your interest to the employee groups. We explore how your interest can be met, and we address labor's interest to the extent possible. Here is the process that's dictated by city code. September 1, the employee groups should have requested officially that the negotiations begin. Both PFFA and COPS did do that by September 1. And then by September 15th, we were um, supposed to respond to that with our interests, which we did to both organizations. And then the council presentation is tonight. Um, 10 days after this, within 10 days after this presentation, negotiations will begin. Um, and each side has four individuals, up to four individuals at the table. For the city, we will have Dee Dee Gates as our main negotiator. And for fire, she will have um, someone assisting her, an HR consultant by the name of um, Kamali Russell. And then for um, COPS, we will also have Gina Valenzuela assisting. Um, so the negotiations will continue. Um, they need to end no later than December 15th. If there is an agreement in December, on December 15th, then um, either side can request mediation. Um, and then if mediation does not result in um, a decision, then we will be back at here to discuss our interest to, to come to resolution. The study session is a result of that city code amendment in 2014. Um, it is a result of the employee organization's request to, for them to be able to present their interest to you personally. Um, and there's no action required by you at this time. You can consider, of course, the information that you're about to hear from us as well as from them when you provide direction to us in an executive session. Here are our interests for the negotiations for 2017. We would like a negotiation process that um, encourages transparency, maintains the integrity of all parties and the roles of all parties, follows ground rules, regular communication to you from us. We want a relationship that's respectful and positive. 
We want to foster ongoing collaboration and problem solving. The city of Peoria continues to want to maintain their competitiveness and ability to recruit and retain quality employees. We want well-trained and competent workforce, highly skilled and motivated workforce. And we want a memorandum of understandings that are multi-year, are based upon sustainable data-based increases within fiscal constraints. We want to be able to compare labor cost based on a total compensation analysis and make data-driven decisions. Um, Historically, we have provided some total compensation analysis based on 12 cities that we review on a regular basis, um, and we want to continue comparing those um, costs um, as we have in the past. We want to explore pay for performance opportunities, establish and maintain efficient allocation of staffing resources, and um, we want clear and concise language in these memo memorandums of understanding, and we want clearly established roles and responsibilities for both management and labor. And lastly, we want to ensure the city's financial viability and to sustain core services. With that, I would like to invite COPS representatives John Mack and Ed Bakke to present their interests. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members for uh, this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, this is something that uh, Mr. Swenson is right. Um, the labor groups got together, and this is something that we wanted to do, the opportunity to speak with you, address our interests, and get the opportunity to do that open dialogue between the labor groups and the, and the city. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, first thing I want to do is um, introduce myself for those of you that haven't had time to spend any Free moments with me. Um, I'm John Mack. I'm the current sitting president for the City of Peoria Police Supervisors. And sitting next to me is Edward Baki. He's the vice president and lead negotiator for the, our association. Our COPS is going to send a negotiation team, the same team we sent uh, four years ago, to the table. Edward Baki, who I've already introduced. Uh, Louis Aponte, who is a current uh, sitting treasurer for the association, and Jason Wraith, who uh, is our secretary, couldn't be here tonight. He's closing on his house, so they took priority. I didn't agree with it, but that's what he did. Um, first thing I'd like to start off by saying is that we're currently under a four-year contract that all the members of our association um, feel is fair and um, has been something that uh, we've been actually I'm pretty excited about the way that it turned out for us and the way that the contract terms and things like that. So we really feel that uh, negotiations, even though a little speed bumps last time, went pretty well for us. And we're looking forward to that again. Um, and there's a lot of things in our current contract that we like to continue forward as we move into our the negotiation process. One of the interests that we do have, and I think that this interest will benefit both our association and the city, um, is our current sick leave status. Um, as you can see that we accrue sick leave at 1,152 hours and it's paid out at 25% into an employee's paycheck if you go over that, that time. Um, upon retirement, members receive 50% of that payout and it can go into various 457 or 401A or whatever else. What we've been experiencing from our end, from the association side of it, is terminal leave. And employees that are getting near retirement feel that they want that 100% sick payout and they're going to get it somehow and so they establish a terminal leave, an eye infection or something that they don't see themselves coming to work. Well, what that does is it, it sorry. Eye infection, don't see themselves coming yeah. to work. I got it. I got um, it. That's no good. pun intended. So what, what that does with our, with our rank is it, 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 we lose that opportunity for that senior person to mentor and develop a new person. It puts a hole in our staffing. Um, and it causes some staffing issues and supervisory issues within, within our department, and it's throughout, whether it's the officers and all the way through our chain of command. Um, where this benefits the city is um, a lot of times that hole is filled by paying overtime, time and a half rate. So technically you're kind of paying twice. So we feel this is a, an opportunity and an interest that uh, as we get into this, both the city and the association with, we think will be beneficial. 
Um, and we think that it's something that uh, will help in the future of keeping those employees, giving that incentive not to use or just randomly abuse their sick time as they see fit and give them the incentive to help their retirement and drive that retirement by setting those uh, incentives in place to put that money into their 457 or 401A accounts as an additional retirement, keeping them here to mentor and develop newer supervisors. Uh, one of the things that we, in our interest too, um, one of our current, um, it's currently in our MOU, is hours worked. And this is something that we went through and established in our last contract. And what we have found um, through, as we've moved through this contract, is we needed to kind of define what exactly, what hours were being worked and how they were being worked. Um, and define the, the difference between administrative responsibilities, things that are planned throughout our, our workday, and then un unfortunately in our environment, the things that are unplanned and things that you end up on long shifts for or missing family, family functions. So um, we have it currently that if a member uses two, 10 or more hours of leave in a week, that any additional time that they work above and beyond their normal duties after that, it's, it's paid to them as straight time. Um, we feel um, under the administrative side of it makes perfect sense to us, completely understandable. If I'm held to a meeting or I need to attend a meeting or do whatever, completely understandable. But where this really kind of affects our members is that last minute um, priority call for service where they're not gonna make it home to dinner or they're not gonna do um, make it to a certain family function and it's unforeseen and it's operational and they don't have an option but to be out there on that scene until that scene has been handled and investigated and, and cleared up. And so we think that if we go through and we define exactly some of those duties and, and clarify some of the hours worked, it'll help bring clarity to not only our administration but also to the city and, and our association members as well. Um, this is a this is something that we noticed um, after our, our current our contract was signed. This is our interest. The third interest is just to uh, change the language in the drop program, which is set forth by the state retirement. Um, they changed language after our contract was already set. We would just like to update that language. Um, it just makes sense to follow with the, with those laws and rules, and we just want the, the, our uh, MOU to follow that. So based on what their current litigation and significant changes, it's not really much. There's just some things in there that we just wanted to, to follow what the state has put out. So pretty simple. And then one of the things that we've noticed in planning for the future is our retirement plans and the continuity between all the plans. Um, when many of us were promoted from officer to sergeant, the officers have a uh, sick plan or some sort of health plan that doesn't transfer with you. And it's a plan that currently just sits there and pays fees and we can't do anything with it. So when we started, in our last negotiation, started to try to develop um, retirement plans for the future. So in other words, if a sergeant promotes to lieutenant, a lieutenant to commander, those retirement plans will continue to follow them through the rank. Um, currently, we have a 401A, which is very similar, set up to the lieutenant's 401A plan. And our interest is strictly to see if, if the law allows or if the, if the city, we can work out making that transfer as we move up in rank. Um, we've, we've got several of our lieutenants that have got multiple 401A plans going and all sorts of things because as they've moved, they have to keep developing all these plans. And I think it would help, help the city manage and, and streamline those a little bit, make it a lot easier for HR and stuff to, to manage that type of stuff and understand what needs to be done with them. And then it also, again, it benefits the association by as you promote, it follows you through, through the ranks. And that's it. Pretty simple. Wow. All right. Council, any comments? Questions? All right. Well, thank you. We really appreciate you making this nice and plain and simple for us so even we can understand it. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much for thank expressing you. Appreciate your the interest time. Thank to you. us tonight. <coughs> Thanks. Next on the agenda is PFFA. I can invite 
Hunter Clare and Brian Leathers to present their interests. <laughs> the blue was very nice. <laughs> So I apologize for not having that hard copy here for you all tonight, but uh, we'll kind of address just a few things. Ours is kind of down and dirty. Hopefully I don't mess this thing up. So first off, thank you all very much for having us. I'm Hunter Clare. I'm the president of the PFFA or United Phoenix Firefighters Association. It kind of depends on which one we go off of. Um, but anywho, the Peoria chapter president. Sitting to my right here, this is Brian Leathers. He'll be on our executive board. He's uh, our uh, interim, so basically if anything happens to me, he takes over. Many of you have met him and seen him around, but uh, he's the one that keeps me in line overall. Um, the rest of our board that's not here right now is Ben Burns, Nick Gonzalez, and Chad Cortman. They're all out. Um, we have requested through Didi, if at all possible, because only four people are allowed to sit on the thing, but we have a five-person panel. We did add that request to see if we could potentially have a fifth person so one wasn't rotating in and out and kind of missing out. But, uh, you know, either way it goes, we did put that request on the table so everybody knows, and that is a little outside of code because our board's a little different sized. Um, moving forward, Brian and I will be the two lead negotiators coming up with the assistance of the three that I mentioned. Um, but... Same with us, we, we are currently coming to the end of a two-year contract. Um, we appreciate everything that the city has uh, set forth for our, our membership. We did very well in this last one, and I think we moved in the standard. Um, <clears throat> coming to those areas, the standard that we have and areas that we'll talk about is we still find ourselves slightly behind. Um, so with that being said, I'll start our presentation. It's kind of to the point. So since everything wasn't there, we put our goals up. I know it's kind of small, so we really apologize. We put 17 Valley cities here knowing that that's us included in it. So there's actually only 16 comparable cities. And when I go to the next slide, I'll talk where the city actually does 13 with us being the 14th. And I'll, I'll yank out the ones that they don't recognize, or 12 with us being the 13th, the four that they don't recognize. And we're totally willing to take those areas out, but just as we did our compensation study, we did all 17 valley departments, okay? So the main areas that we'd hit here when we're coming through, and this is, again, you had our, our goals and our interests. The first 13 interests that we had were strictly language changes inside the contract. So there was a no cost uh, tied to them. They were basically cleaning up language, going into different areas that we'd had areas that we've talked about, areas that HR has talked with our administration about to try to clear it, to make our uh, language less am ambiguous in the contract, more we all know exactly where we're going and we're hoping to work forward on those. So we hope you've gotten a chance to read those. I tried to give some brief historical history in all of our areas as to what we felt that it would do and move through that. Um, as we've come into any other areas, the main focus of where we're going at is there's our compensation and annual salary. And then there's our total compensation package, which Laura brought up in the area being over there, is being competitive in that range. And that has been an area where we've been lacking in past years, and we're hoping to bring that up. So it's that overall enticing piece that brings the best qualified candidates to us. In that area, we'd like to focus more on retirement style things for our members. So as the firefighters here in the Valley, we're exposed to the most things throughout our career, right? The most chemicals. And in that, when it comes to retirement, we have the lowest lifespan after retirement. And it's one of those areas where we'd like to look out for our health a little bit more moving forward and ensure that our families are set up for retirement by looking into areas like our 457, increasing those areas, our RHS style stuff, some different health care, and then also looking into programs that would be more based for our members. So the type of traumatic scenes that our, that our firefighters will see, you know, pulling people out of burning buildings, drowning patients, 
different really traumatic stuff that traditional counselors aren't used to seeing and dealing with. We'd like to shift more into a more fire-based program for EAP stuff. So as we roll into our there, there's our next comparable city. So the 16, us being the 17th, the four on there that the city doesn't do and we're willing to pull those out would be Daisy Mountain, Sun City, Sun City West, and Sun Lakes, which all four of those are the fire districts that are in the valley. So they do things slightly different and we would totally be willing to concede to yank those out just as the city does out of any of the thing there. So if you wanna cross them out, we're okay with that. It's just when we do our compensation package, we compensate, we go over everybody. So some background from what we look at. So we do a background on, on the city every year. We do an independent evalu fiscal evaluation of the city just as they do in your CAFA reports that you put out. Um, so those coming in, the first thing that we'd like to do is applaud our city and the city manager and, and the direction that you all have given us through this time. Some of you have been a part of the board, some of you are new to the board, some of you are returning to the board, but you've experienced this entire thing along the way. And during the recession, while other cities were seeing 12 to 13% massive hits, our city, by your leadership and what Carl had laid out, out there with your fiscal responsibility, we were only seeing around 3% hits, not quite the same damage that some other city and areas were seeing. In the time since the recession, we've actually watched most of our levels return to pre-recession levels or close to in a lot of areas. At that same time, we've actually increased our fund to debt ratio within the general fund. So back as the recession happened, we were looking at about a 6.5 dollars to every one dollar of debt that we had. We had 6.5 dollars to pay for it. Currently, we're about two dollars more than that at eight to one. It's actually greater than eight to one, so that's why I said about two to one while we're sitting there. For every dollar of debt that we have, we have eight dollars to pay for that one, a little bit more. Um, off of the same time, on the GFOA, or the Government Finance Officers Association, they usually request or say to most cities that you want to keep two months or 16.67% of money in the general fund. That's two months operating budget in case anything was to really go wrong. Our city, again, with that great leadership, is looking at about 3.5 times that. So what's that mean to us? It means if anything goes really wrong, we're looking at roughly about seven months worth of money to be able to pay for those things. That's good. That means that we have the areas there to pay for the needs that we have in case anything ever hits us again. And again, we want to thank you guys for helping us through those economic times and the employee groups that were willing to take, step up, take pay freezes, make concessions to make things work for their members the way that it's going. Um, some different things that we have going in here that are different for the firefighters than some of the other entities that we have um, is no Social Security or Medicare. So for our ASME people around the city and other areas in, I'm not sure exactly how HR works, but we don't pay Medicare or Medicaid, Social Security for our firefighters. We're actually, if we do get that out of another job that we have outside of the city, we actually take a two thirds penalty on it if we get it because of our current position in the PSPRS. So that means that the city is paying 7.65% less for each firefighter employee than they may be paying for other employees in the city because we're not eligible for those benefits from the city. Um, same token, the 401A, which we heard our, uh, our cops talk about back here, and other entities have that, and that's another 4.5% savings account for retirement. Again, it's not another entity that we don't have in the fire service, and these are some of the things that we're just saying that why our concerns are on retirement side and healthcare areas when we're coming into play. On top of that, with our background these last few years, pension reform. The firefighters have been at the forefront of pension reform on two different bills, sitting down to try to pass those through on areas that we feel that that would not only you know, save the taxpayers, but help our cities out. And I've provided you all with that information before on talking points on some of the areas, the good, the bad, and the indifferent in between in those areas to allow you to talk educated on that stuff. But we were at the forefront on, on doing that and just know that that's where we stand is trying to make sure that we all work together to be successful. You know, Peoria has to be, you know, solvent in order for us to have a job and a career that we love to come to. So our membership. Some background on that. We're an all hazards fire department. So what does that mean? A lot of people don't know. So we provide the medical care, so that means paramedic and emergency medicine coming through. We also do fires, any kind that you can think of. We have hazmat calls and we actually have the busiest hazmat team in the entire state of Arizona as in the city of Peoria. Technical rescue, so that's mountain rescues, trench rescues, different things. We have some of the innovation that started that actually in the entire world 
comes out of the city of Peoria, just letting you know the level where we're at. The rescue swimmer and fire boat operations, we have the largest body of water that has a workable fire department on top of it, thanks to you all. We are now currently staffed at four people full time, providing the great service on that fire boat and everything else that we have. But we are expanding our services, getting more being out there. And then wildland, wildland. So not, we have a big urban interface with what we have here in the city of Peoria and as that stretch goes. So we've had some minor wildland fires, but we're also very involved in the state and outside wildland entities to keep our skills sharp for when it comes back to our city and we're there. Outside of that, we have the largest scope of practice for firefighter paramedics in the state of Arizona. There isn't a single fire department in the valley that has as many skills and is able to push as many medications to help people in a time of need as your Peoria firefighter paramedics are. So we're really at the top of the game when it comes to those areas, bringing in new tiles of programs out of the U of A, different things that we can try out. We're there and on the cutting edge. We've also had recent expanded services with the ARV and the ambulances or rescues coming soon here. So we're gonna be able to provide even a more expanded and proper form of care to our citizens. Outside of those areas, our Peoria Firefighters Charities, or the PFFC, has partnered with the city and done things on our own. Most recently, we've had the breast cancer awareness, right? Um, we have our CPR in schools, we have our senior programs, and uh, you know our Christmas programs, amongst many more. Our firefighters are really committed to this city, and you see that last one that says ownership. I know you've all heard me say this before, but 50% of our firefighters live in the city of Peoria which means they buy into those six block letters. They live here, they pay taxes, they utilize the services. So when it comes to expanding our area, they not only know what they want as an employee, they know what they want from the services that they're receiving. So pay deficits, this is just what we'll hit an area. Um, so outside of that, we just wanna give when we're coming into the things. The many things that we talked about, I've talked with many of you. We've worked in your council districts on different uh, activities, whether it's community pancake breakfasts, you know, we've been in your community schools, we've done events with you, same thing here with the city. Um, we've worked on, you know, programs that benefit the city. And, and I've heard over and over how outstanding the work is that our firefighters do. And I would agree with you 100%. Um, you know, our, our citizens have spoke on many of the polls as to where we sit. You know, we, we sat there for two years in a row as the highest ranked city under 200,000 people for approval rating for our firefighters. They'd never seen approval ratings that high before at 98%. Never. So that's huge. That's market ship to what we're doing and the product that we're putting out there. That being said, when we come into our annual salary, the things that we just wanna let you know is our average ranking out of our 17 cities would be 13 of 17, and that's averaging everything together, and that's just on salary. If we go to total compensation package, so what the other stuff that goes on top of it, we fall to 16 of 17. Again, some of the numbers vary as to what we're looking at, and those could move depending on what exact numbers you're, you're, you're totally comparing, but we just took everything together and put those lumps in there. So what does that mean for our salary? So as it comes to salary as a whole, so firefighters, engineers, and captains, we're 3.82% behind the mean, so the average, the mean from where we are in pay. That's where we are in just pay compensation. From the top department, we're 13.32% behind. As for total compensation package, we're 11.5% or 11.15% behind the mean and 21.44% behind the top. So, right, all of our numbers are based off of next year's contract. So this year we're all in the middle of, we already have a contract that's rolling through there. So if you look at any of our numbers and any comparisons that are done, we didn't use the numbers that are this year because we have a contract through this year right? We looked at anybody that had a contract that would move into next year when we'd be comparing against them. So where we currently are and where we will be, what we're trying to get to. So say like Phoenix. Phoenix has a contract that rolls through 2019, right? So we didn't compare this year's number because this year's number is already obsolete because we're already working under a contract for this year. We compared their next year, July 1, contract in comparison to our numbers now because you all will be made to give direction on where we want to be going into that comparison time. 
you get where I'm going there? Because there has been some confusion as to where our numbers are. They're not right now, today's date. There are those ones. There's also three or four uh, entities that are negotiating at the same time as us. So Chandler's negotiating right now, Glendale's negotiating. Um, so there's some of them, there's a couple others that are negotiating, so they'll have a different numbers, but we can only take a snapshot of what we currently know is going on and what we know will be happening July 1 of next year, which we'll be comparing to. So outside of that, when it comes into that area, we're not asking to be the top. We totally understand that 20%, 15%, that's completely unreasonable. It's not sustainable, right? But what we would like is we'd like to make an active effort to make our market salary competitive, not just in the salary range, but in our total compensation package, making it something where we get the best of the best here. I believe, and I think you believe, that we have some of the best firefighters all the way around in the valley. But fire departments are starting to hire again. And we already saw it recently inside of this. In our, not this past hiring process, but the one before, we had a member that was offered a job from us and a job from a different city at the same time. And at the end of the day, they took our job first, then got that offer, looked at the total package, and chose to leave and go to that other city. We don't want to have that continue happen. When I first got hired on about 10, 15 years ago when things were going, we were losing a few people a year to other organizations. We don't want to spend our money training these individuals and then having other people come in and pick our people away. And that's why we thank you for putting that in there and wanting to be competitive and we thank you for pushing for that and we hope that we will. The other thing that our ask would be is enhanced programs. So some of that stuff that I talked, some of the different needs that we have for medical than maybe other departments may have. Some of that, uh, you know, our cancer rate is greater than 50% in some areas, it's greater than that, even others. We'd like to maybe look at some expanded coverages or some different stuff that we could do for our group in our pool. Same thing with retirement and EAP programs. I think we've hit on that <coughs> enough as to where those different areas. And then clarify, clarifying our contract. So no cost language changes. Things that we can sit down, we can come to, and we can make it clear so it's black and white, there's no confusion, and we all know where we sit. So with that said, uh, we'll answer any questions on anything that you'd had or seen, but we really thank you for your time and listening to us, and we look forward to moving ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Any, any comments or questions? Yes, Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Hunter, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, Peoria Firefighters has the largest scope of, of practice for firefighters and paramedics yes, in sir. the state. How did, uh, how did that happen? How did, what did you do differently? What did Peoria Firefighters do differently than other organizations to make you the best at, at this? Well, the best way that I can go about that is we had a very progressive department. And we had a great leader that came on about 13, 14 years ago in our department. And that would be Jim Bratcher, our Deputy Chief Bratcher. I think you all have met with him and dealt with him extensively, along with Chief Reese on the ambulance stuff recently. And as you know, having a person like that that comes on board, he came over from Mesa, and he was very progressive into the paramedic stuff. He'd been a paramedic himself in the field, and he was really on the pulse of where community paramedicine was going, where firefighters could be more enhanced in the paramedic community, because he'd been there. It just wasn't a chief position that he had gotten to. He had served as a paramedic in the field. He knew what was going on. So we had a leader like that that came through and really pushed moving in so when the U of A or uh, Good Sam, I think it's called University of Arizona Medical Center now, um, when they pushed forward with new programs like RSI, which allowed us to uh, innovate people that were in a traumatic situation, traumatic brain injury studies came on board, spinal cord studies, anything that came up, he jumped on and said our firefighters could do that. So we kept taking that level and pushing it a little higher, a little higher, and pretty soon, you know, we're setting the bar on things that are being done. We also, as of recent, have had, you know, Fire Chief Bobby Reese been here. So he's four years in, or four, three and three quarters, right? Moving into that fourth and fifth year of where he's at. And he came over from Phoenix. So he saw the initial progression that had happened in the fire service in the early 70s. He was on that front line and knew what had come in in paramedicine when it was a brand new thing. And he took some of that stuff with the rescues and the ARVs and he's kept his finger on the pulse and he's allowed us to push forward and provide a better service to our community now through those new programs. So when it comes down to it is we had employees that were willing and wanting to push the level of service because again, they lived here. 
their families are here. They want the best and the most working on their families in case an incident happened. And we hired progressive great people from other areas to come in and push us forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? All right. Okay. We really appreciate learning about your interests and look forward to moving forward with Thanks. negotiations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Mr. Swenson, anything else? No, that, that's all we have um, before the break, but I just want to uh, thank the presenters. Um, good presentations. We appreciate that uh, and sharing your interests with the City Council. And, uh, Council, we will be uh, back with you. Um, hopefully, the, the next presentation we make on this subject will be to present agreements. Great. Um, so, thank you for your time, and that's all we have tonight. All right. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned until our 7 o'clock meeting.